Welcome to this video on superior semicircular canal dehiscence syndrome. Before we begin, consider the following questions. What is superior semicircular canal dehiscence? How does this present and why? What might you find on examination? How would you investigate a suspected case of this? What are vestibular evoked myogenic potentials? And how would you treat superior semicircular canal dehiscence? The inner ear consists of the hearing and balance organs, which are surrounded by extremely dense otic capsule bone. This dense bone prevents sound from entering the inner ear from pathways other than through the oval window or, to a lesser extent, the round window. The organs of balance include the otolith organs and the three semicircular canals, the superior, lateral and posterior semicircular canals. Superior semicircular canal dehiscence is when the bone that surrounds the membranous canal is absent and this can be seen in approximately 2% of the population and is often asymptomatic. The reason for this absence is unknown but it is likely that the bone is absent from birth or is thin at birth and subsequently is eroded over time. When this bony dehiscence results in symptoms this is called superior semicircular canal dehiscence syndrome. Symptoms are mainly due to excessive vibrational energy entering the inner ear through this third window causing hearing and balance disturbance. The classical symptoms include hyperacusis and exaggerated bodily sounds, otherwise known as autophony. These extend beyond being able to hear your own voice loudly and in a distorted way, and can include hearing one's own eyes moving in their sockets, the heavy sound of footfall, and pulsatile tinnitus. Patients may experience Tullio's phenomenon, where loud noises cause dizziness. This is because of the sound energy causing movement in the endolymph, which is interpreted by the brain as movement. Patients may also report brain fog and lethargy due to the unusual amount of energy required for the simpler act of keeping the body in equilibrium amongst all the confusing signals from the dysfunctional semicircular canal. A full neurootological examination should be performed. Otoscopy would be normal but pneumatic otoscopy may cause nystagmus with a fast phase to the side of the dehiscence. Weber's with a 256 or 512 Hz fork may lateralize to the side of the dehiscence with bone conduction greater than air conduction on Rinne's test. A tuning fork applied to the elbow or ankle can often be heard in the side of the dehiscence. An audiogram may show a low frequency conductive hearing loss or supranormal thresholds, particularly on bone conduction. The reason for the conductive hearing loss is because vibrations entering the ear canal and the middle ear are abnormally diverted through the superior canal and into the intracranial space instead of being registered by the organ of hearing. The diagnosis is confirmed by a triad of characteristic symptoms, reduced thresholds for vestibular evoked myogenic potentials and a CT demonstrating the dehiscence. A high resolution non-contrast CT in the postural plane will demonstrate thinning or absence of the bone surrounding the superior semicircular canal. VEMPs are contractions of the muscles in the neck or around the eye due to activation of the vestibular ocular and vestibular colic reflexes. When a 500 Hz tone above a certain amplitude is presented to the ear, this triggers subtle contractions in the ocular and cervical muscles. This threshold is usually around 100 decibels. When there is a dehiscence, however, a lower amplitude is required to trigger this reflex and so contractions around the eye and the sternocleidomastoid can be detected at amplitudes as low as 65 decibels. Although the treatment of this condition is surgical, many patients may elect not to have surgery, instead feeling that receiving a diagnosis is sufficient. However, for others, the symptoms may be so debilitating that the patient is very motivated for surgery. The surgical approach can either be transmastoid or via middle cranial fossa approach. A transmastoid repair involves a cortical mastoidectomy, identification of the superior semicircular canal, fenestrating the ascending and descending limb of the superior semicircular canal, and plugging the canal with muscle or fibrous tissue. This in effect isolates the area of the canal which has the dehiscence. In addition, or alternatively to this, Resurfacing the dehiscent portion of the superior semicircular canal 
with a mixture of bone dust and tissue glue such as tisseal can also be performed. Particular care should be taken when performing this operation via transmastoid approach as the tegmen is often low lying and may have multiple areas of dehiscence. Another option to treat this is via plugging of the round window. Although the efficacy of this approach is not as high, this can be reserved for cases which are refractory to treatment via plugging and or resurfacing. I hope you found this video useful. If so, please consider subscribing and let us know what you'd like us to cover next.